Hello, are you looking for a new home for the indie? Well, why not submit and purchase indie film from the brand new Scream Team releasing? Because Justin Seaman will be the man you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Everything Horror Podcast. My name is Paul Dolsky, and tonight Tessa is going to be missing out. She's not feeling too great, but uh, she'll be back as soon as possible. Um, Anyways, we got a very special guest tonight, all the way from Scream Team releasing. We got the man behind the mask or man behind the uh, the skull, wh- wh- whatever we want to call it, uh, Justin Seaman. How's it going, Justin? Good. How are you, Paul? I'm good. Thank you so much for uh, accepting the invite and coming on to talk for a little bit. So I no, appreciate no problem, it. Man. I'm excited. Well, good. And I hope you have a great time here, <laughs> I hope. So um, – Real quick, Justin, for people like me and Tessa, who is absent right now, uh, and then for those that are listening, can you tell us a little about yourself of how you got into horror? Yeah, so um, I, I, you know, I grew up as one of those kids in the uh, late '80s, early '90s that uh, kind of strolled through the video stores and uh, was drawn to the, you know, the box art of horror films and urged and begged my parents to let me rent them until they caved in and, you know, let me take home, you know, all the movies I should have never seen as a child. And, uh, you know, between that and, um, you know, Monster Vision and USA Up All Night, just uh, constantly searching for something I've never seen and, you know, always being drawn towards the horror uh, side of, of, you know, of films. It eventually just led to wanting to make movies myself, and um, since I was just, a, you know, probably about five years old is when I first started making little shorts, and that led through high school into college, and uh, eventually into my late 20s, I got a chance to make my first uh, feature horror film, which was called The Barn, and um, <clears throat> since then, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people, networked, and uh, I began Scream Team releasing to help other filmmakers get their content out there. Wow. And that's a pretty young age to start in the uh, filmmaking, too, I must say. So, yeah, they're, they're not good. good. <laughs> they don't look yeah. good, but you know, it was, it was uh, the you know, there was effort in it. Hey, that's what counts, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like it's like us, I mean, when we first started, it's not so great but i think after almost being two years of doing it i think we've made a big improvement so uh yeah <laughs> i just don't count the first episode as the uh, episode really <laughs> yeah yeah uh real quick uh justin which you probably already mentioned it was in that uh elaborate more there we go there's that word yeah man what a day. um so what what did really exactly inspired you to start Scream Team really? Well, um, I had toured the barn on my own, um, just doing the festival circuit and the convention circuit. And uh, I would meet a lot of filmmakers at these places and they'd see my setup and see me selling and just kind of asking how I did it and how I was doing it on my own without the help of a distro company because uh, there's just a lot of negativity behind distro companies where the filmmaker usually doesn't see any money or, you know, there's a lot of shadiness where um, money's being relocated or false, you know, bookings are made to uh, just, just for the distro to make money off the movie and, you know, keep as much as they can. And uh, so I was approached by a lot of filmmakers 
filmmakers over the years to uh, essentially ask if I would sell their movie for them, and uh, like how I did with The Barn, and I just I had no interest in it whatsoever because that's I stayed away from distros myself. And uh, it wasn't until probably about a year and a half ago when uh, my friend Rocky Gray, who ended up, uh, he was the composer for The Barn, he ended up making a movie called 1031, and I helped him uh, on that, and I, I did one of the segments in there. And um, when it was all said and done, he wanted to do the same thing that I did, market it himself, sell it himself. And uh, about a month into selling the product himself, he contacted me and just said, man, I, I totally underestimated the workload here, you know, with the shipping and talking to the customers and any kind of issues. And and he, he's in bands. Um, he's a musician. He used to be in um, Evanescence, and uh, he plays in Living Sacrifice and We Are the Fallen and all that. So he does a lot of mastering for other bands. So this was kind of something he wanted to do on the side and didn't really – uh, take into consideration how much work it was going to be. And um, because it was Rocky, I did it. Uh, if it would have been anybody else, I would have continued to say no. But because it was Rocky and I was involved in 1031, I decided I would help him out. And it it worked great. And um, I had more people coming to me and asking me to help. And I just started thinking, you know what? I'm the kind of person that I was looking for when I was searching for a distro company. And I never did find a distro company that made me feel comfortable. So uh, you know, I kind of figured if I couldn't find the distro company, I'll become the distro company and I'll help other filmmakers. And, you know, we're, we're getting, we, I think probably just here in about a couple of days, it's going to be a full year that Scream Team has uh, been official. And I've got about 10 to 12 different filmmakers uh, on the catalog with me now and um, really good friendships and relationships. And it's just n nice to know that, um, you know, these are people that can trust me. And, you know, I told them, I said, I have a face out there. I, I go to these shows. People know me. I'm not some guy behind a desk that's going to screw you over and you'll never catch me. Um, you know, <laughs> somebody will find me. I'm out there. Uh, but, you know, that, that's pretty much the story in a nutshell, how Scream Team started. And, um, you know, it's going great. And I hope it continues for a very long time. I completely agree. And, you know, like I talked with Rocky a few times and um, one of these days I want to get him on to talk about his film 1031 as well. But mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to help somebody like you because um, just to throw it out there, I know this is later down, but I think this is like a, a per perfect opportunity to actually bring it in since you brought up the whole, you, you were searching for that, that type of company to help you out. But since you can find one, as you put it, you know, you became it. So yeah. with that being said, now you probably heard of the news lately throughout January that Amazon seemed to be, you know, targeting the indie films and then they're also pulling them down without notifying people as well. Yeah, so what, what do you like to, so not what would you like, but you know, what did you think of that? And t on top of like, you know, like what you do, that, which is help indies. So did you ever, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, I tell people a lot of filmmakers, I mean, we live in a digital age and um, there's a lot of uncertainties, you know, especially with pirating and things. Um, I like to focus you know, with screen team just on the physical media because, you know, I'm selling to collectors pretty much, people who like uh, to have something that they can physically hold and look at. And those are the people that are buying for me and they're, they're buying the, the content I put out. And um, I have this discussion all the time where a lot of filmmakers think they're going to make buku bucks off of digital. And if you make the right deals for digital, I mean, sure, yes. If you can get into, you know, Netflix or Shutter or any other place, you know, and um, get an exclusive deal, yeah, you're going to make some money. But for the most part, you know, it's, you're relying on people to rent something um, when they could steal it just as easily as they're typing it in on the Google to find an avenue to rent it. And uh, so you got to, you know, you're depending on people to be honest, which is kind of hard with the digital age. And um, it's unfortunate with Amazon, but it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, <clears throat> if you want to have something and you want to own it and you want to, you know, you want to get a hold of things that aren't as accessible, you can still support physical media and, you know, and buy this content. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of films that I, I don't understand the uh, the choosing process because there's films out there that I'm still seeing that, you know, they're not the best indie films, but they're still up. And there's some really good indie films that have been taken down. So I really don't know the rhyme or reason of why this is happening. And it's, it's very unfortunate because I know a lot of filmmakers depend on, you know, the prime views 
uh, you know, making money off their off their films. Um, I will say though, uh, it, are you familiar with Tubi at all? Tubi, you said? Yeah, T U B I. It's it's kind of becoming like the new Amazon Prime, except for it's completely free. You don't you know you don't have to have a service. Uh, but they they put a lot of indie films up there now. Um, I got the barn on there, and I made more money off of the Tubi views uh, through digital than any of the paid platforms. Um, including Prime, so so I think people are starting to switch. You know, they're they're starting to switch gears now, and they're seeing um, there's other people coming up, and and Tubi would be a perfect example of a company that's coming in and kind of taking advantage of that. So I think you're going to hear a lot more from them uh, moving forward. I actually need to check this Tubi out because that's definitely not under my radar because I don't think I've ever heard of that, or if I have, I haven't heard anything of it in a long time that I just forgot about it. I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to check this out. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so thank for your input on that though, by the way, because you know, that's a really rough issue that's going on right now. And, uh, you know, I talked with Todd Jenkins about Cherokee Creek recently, and I had him talk about the thoughts about how, him and his mother, how they both felt, um, you know, who I Todd stated on our podcast, too, that his mother is handicapped. And the way Todd looked at it was making this film, would, he was hoping that it would be a little bit of a success. So that way he could help, you know, ha- get fun to help pay for, you know, his mother's uh build and stuff for the hospitals and stuff and you know yeah. i found that to be like one of the most it, like amazing things that i can ever hear and the reason why i'm bringing this up too is because just like you justin you gave what was that a whole month of december i think it was a that you were gonna you were doing what was it the 100 percent fund that you got went to billy pond for his cancer fund? Yes, every, uh, we actually, I got inventory from Billy for Circus of the Dead and um, every unit that we sold, we gave him all the money and then anything outside of that that we made profit on for any other film, that scre- it's Scream Team's profit, not the filmmaker's profit, we donated to Billy as well to help him with his uh, cancer fund. Yeah, see that, that's, that's amazing right there. And I think uh, you probably saw my name going through a few, uh, few times, I think, in December, I think it was. So, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. You for that. yeah, you're very welcome. And I thank you again for sending me the three uh, thank you n- notes. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it gets hard. I, I know your name comes up through, but it gets hard to keep track of who we gave them to. And we did a limited run, and um, they're all gone now. We only did a 250 of those. So <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got three of the 250 there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just I was just like looking at him. I go, I don't need to jump in, but okay. So yeah. I, I kind of started thinking like, yeah, well, he probably really forgot who he gave him to. So I was just like, I'll let it slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, um, in all seriousness, no. In, wow. In all seriousness, there we go. Long day at work, I swear. Um, you know, so what? So with your Scream Team releasing, what is your mission that you want to do with Scream Team? Especially if you're willing to help other filmmakers like this. And speaking of helping filmmakers and stuff like that that are indie, um, I don't know if it's still going on, but so pr- please correct me. But uh, are the funds for the first volume of blood that you have still going toward the making of volume the blood three? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. So I guess, so yeah. So Justin, what is your mission with scream team and how, like, and how are you, uh, picking in one? Well, you might have to correct me, but I'm trying to figure out the right word, but how are you going about, picking and choosing which films or even how, how did you even uh, get the idea of how helping Billy Pond anyway? Um, so I, uh, 
we also ran uh, Zane and I, Zane Hershberger. He's my buddy, and uh, he shot the barn with me, and we, we worked together. And he's making a film called Force to Fear right now. And um, we've been running a indie drive-in film festival for about three years. And our second year, we um, we played Circus of the Dead. And it was just basically because we, we go to conventions and film, you know, different film festivals, and we kind of keep an eye out for what movies are, you know, hot on the scene. And Circus of the Dead played it a lot. It actually played with some at the barn. And uh, so we reached out to Billy and said, you know, we do this event here at an old drive-in. You know, we think it'd be a cool, uh, you know, film, film to show if you'd be interested. And that's kind of how we started the relationship. Well, Billy is now one of the um, directors on a project that we're wrapping up called Cryptids. And uh, he did a segment in the in the film where he focuses on the legends of the Chupacabra. Um, so he's making a he, he made it. He's in post production right now. He's doing um, the short in uh, in Texas, and it has to do with a drug cartel that essentially domesticates Chupacabras uh, to track down um, pretty much people that owe them money for their drugs. So it's kind of a crazy story, but it, it's really cool. He made some cool monsters and stuff, and um. So we've got a relationship there with Billy. So uh, when I noticed that Billy kind of disappeared for social media for like a month or so, um, Zane and I started talking. He's like, yeah, that's really weird because he's usually, you know, on at some point pops in and, um, you know, he's like, I've sent him some messages and he's not responding. He's not looking. And uh, so I sent Billy a message just to check on him. And it was probably a day or two later he made the post saying that he had cancer. Uh, so then – I just call. I straight up called him to check up on him because uh, I didn't want to, you know, in, be too intrusive. But I just wanted, to, you know, I finally called him. I was like, "Hey, man, I'm not calling you about cryptids or anything. This is purely a call. How how are you? How thing, you know, how are things going?" And that's when it came down to I I offered, you know, if he still had inventory, I'd put it up on the site and I'd sell it and send him all the money and do whatever I could to help him out, uh, you know, through what I have, uh, you know, with Stream Team. So, um, you know, that was that was just one filmmaker helping another. And that's, it's essentially what I'm doing with scream team. Um, you know, it's still a business. And, uh, so that's why I have to kind of pick and choose because I get, I get a lot of offers with people who want to work with me and, you know, and unfortunately not every movie, even though you you put your heart and soul into it and, you know, and you know, a lot of people, it, it's not easy making films. I can tell you that, but not everything is marketable and, and can make money. And, um, so I have to, you know, I have to look at it from a filmmaker standpoint and also a business standpoint. Um, and the titles I've picked up are films that have either had a lot of buzz in the festival circuit or I've met the people and I believe in them and, and their vision. And I know going forward, they're going to make even better films and I want to be there from the starting point. Um, but essentially with, you know, my mission with the site is to help indie filmmakers get their films out in the public. Uh, while trying to break the stigma, uh, you know, that's been associated with distribution companies and, and screwing over the artist. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is that there are people out there that can make great movies and they can handle all that. But on the other side, they don't know how to market it. They don't know how to do the day to day operations of selling the content and, take, you know, taking care of customers and shipping problems and manufacturing and all that. And I urge filmmakers, if you are capable of doing it, sell it yourself. Nobody's going to have more enthusiasm and uh, push and drive to sell a product more than the person who put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. But if you don't think you can do that and you're not confident, you know, that's why I'm here because I'll, I'll do that for you. And, um, you know, and and my goal is to make sure they get exposure, but they also make money. And uh, so far, every film we've put out has been in the profit. So it, it's been good. You know, I've made good relationships with these people and I continue, I, you know, I hope to continue to do that. It, yeah, so, see, that's, that's, a, that's a big run on there, but it's <laughs> no, no, no. That's exactly what I was hoping you would you would say anyway, because you know that that's perfect. That's a great mission statement, and that the way you know as you put in it, you uh, you pick and choose, and as you said, you know it's hard, and everybody make the film that a good film too. But as you're looking at it, you got to look at it as a business as a business approach, and you know as most people know some films out there aren't aren't that great and i hate to even say it like that because you know as you said everybody put their blood sweat and tears into creating their own vision of something but it's not always going to catch the audience per se if that makes sense mm -hmm. 
But to yeah. touch on what you were saying, though, Justin, about the whole, you know, uh, people contacting you about committing their film to you or if they have committed a film to you. So this question, it did it a two part um, two part question. Um, so how does one submit a film to you? And is there any kind of fee that you charge for bringing it onto physical media if chosen? No. So they can contact me through the website. Uh, there's a submit your film section. And um, it basically, your the film needs to fall into one of the categories of horror, horror comedy, retro, horror, um, sci-fi, or dark drama. It needs to be at least 70 minutes. And you have to have an uncompressed HD digital master file to start with. Um, that's, that's the bare minimum. Um, and then you can contact me on the site, the contact page. But you can also email me at screamteamreleasing at gmail.com. Um, there's no cost to the filmmakers. Uh, I cover all the expenses. And, uh, you know, it, it comes down to neither of us see profit until the agreed upon expenses to do the run are recouped. So if, you know, if the movie costs X dollars to put out a thousand copies until it reaches X dollars, I'm not going to see a percentage of, of profit and, and neither is the filmmaker. So the goal is obviously to break even early. And then, so as the, you know, the term continues uh, minimum of three year deal that as long as that term continues, you know, then we'll be making profit off of everything after that. So it's, it's I try to keep it really simple. You know, it just depends on if you want to do more marketing or less marketing, you know, there's sometimes there's extra things in there being in the magazines or, you know, sponsored ads or, you know, what have you, but I, I work, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the filmmakers to let them see, let them still have control of how things go. And they can see like, okay, we didn't buy ads this month and the sales were a little low compared to the months that we did buy ads. So let's spend a little bit, you know, the cost of maybe two Blu-ray sales and let's, let's do that and see if it generates, you know, 25 more Blu-ray sales. So, you know, it's just those kind of things. And, and hopefully they learn the business side of it as well, you know, while they're working with me so that down the road they want to attempt something on their own they have more knowledge and once again thank you again for sharing that because that mm -hmm. that's amazing you know like i don't really know you yet but that well justin but just talking and listening to you i can already tell you are a guy who definitely loved the indie horror genre and you just you you are one of those type of rare people that we can trust somebody can trust you enough with their product that you will you know you will find completion if i may say and yeah. you'll help them bring their film to physical media for those that don't even see it like uh i'll i'll, I'll put the film out there again cherokee creek i mean i know yeah. they got through fucking hell and back but i mean and, you know, I talk with Todd all the time. I said, Todd, you need to contact Scream Team. And I don't know why. And I just said, I just, just go to it. Just go and talk to Justin. And I might like, just do it. Just go and talk and con contact Justin and talk about possibly submitting your film to be brought on Blu-ray. And I, and I <laughs> mentioned that again. So, yeah. So, I just wanted to put that out there because you know I I'm de I'm being serious too. Like I don't I have a very big trust issue, but I can already tell with somebody like you, you definitely put your heart and soul into like the indie horror film people who to help them out. At, even though you've already said it, but I can definitely tell. So oh, I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, the last thing I want to do is you know ruin my name and ruin anything you know that I've done, especially since uh, we just. I launched in uh, just this past October the crowdfunding for the barn part two. So, you know, I'll be getting back behind the camera and doing stuff this summer, you know, and the last thing I want is to have a bunch of people, uh, you know, angry at me because I screwed them over for some deals, which, you know, I would never do anyway. So no, I appreciate that. No, you're very welcome. And uh, to touch on what you were saying that you, uh, you, I'm trying to remember how you you worded it. You pr you pretty much deal with everything when it comes to the physical media. So, do you yourself 
make all the physical media or do you go through uh like disc makers or something like that yeah so, yeah, so it goes through a replication house like disc makers but i you know i build and author and design every uh unless unless the the filmmaker is very adamant about doing something themselves with the cover i usually design all the covers uh with their supplied artwork or stills um and then i i build the dvds and you know um proof them and all that stuff and <clears throat> so yeah i mean it's so it, it's just me and occasionally my wife will help me package which is probably how you ended up getting three uh three of those cards <laughs> um <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, just in one release, I probably put a good, um, you know, at least a good solid two weeks into focusing on just one movie. That's why I only put out about a movie a month, if not every month and a half. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but, but once the master's done, that gets sent off and gets manufactured, uh, you know, to a glass master that gets replicated and not duplicated, which, uh, replicated discs are the ones that you see in stores. They've got the silver backs. Uh, duplicated discs are like the burns, like they've got the purple, di you know, a DVD's got a purple back and uh, the, the burn Blu-rays have like the black back. Um, and, you know, they don't always work in all players. These are the ones that are, you know, they're manufactured and they're tested and all that stuff. So uh, region free and all that. And that's, that's kind of one of the issues is um, I know a lot of people that have made deals with distro companies and they're excited their movie gets put on Blu-ray and then they come to find out that it's, it's uh, you know, on demand Blu-ray which means it gets burnt to a disc and they end up getting pretty much like a, a cheap looking scratchable Blu-ray and they're not happy with it. And neither is the consumer because they've been kind of led, you know, there's nowhere to, that, that it says, Hey, you're not going to, you're getting a BDR. And um, so I strive to stay away from that. Uh, I haven't put one out yet other than uh, in the very beginning, we did a, a couple of DVDRs for 1031 because there was leftovers from the Rockies Indiegogo campaign. Hmm. Well, I'll let that slide, but I wouldn't part of that <laughs> Indiegogo. But I mean, but that's interesting. I have a couple uh, uh, season for like TV shows or whatever, especially a show you might know as Ghost Adventure. They yeah. get, they they ended up having good quality DVDs until I forget what season it was. I think it was season eight or something where it was all of a sudden DVR. And I'm just like, what the hell is this? But yeah. It was horrible, but that's good. I mean, I know like with, once again, with Todd from Cherokee Creek, when he was talking to us, he was, he, if he's going to release his film as a physical media, he, he even says, and I quote, he doesn't want to make it cheap. He wants to make it professionally done as he mm -hmm. says it so once again i like how you're looking at it too how you know you're not saying to yourself ah it's just a dvr right like, yeah. yeah, we'll get sold but in reality yeah as you said you know as the customer received it they're gonna go really so yeah yeah exactly and they always say the customer is right Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to to go back to now your first film, I believe, right, which was the barn, um, which you directed and wrote it. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what inspired you to create the barn? So the idea came from just being a little kid, and uh, I spent a lot of summers, well, a lot of just time in general uh, after my parents divorced. My uh, my mom was a waitress, so she worked a lot of nights, and I stayed at my grandparents' house kind of in the countryside. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, static air television, so there wasn't a lot to watch. Uh, so you had to use your imagination and play outside a lot. And um, I'd always had, you know, because of liking horror films and everything, uh, just the thoughts of, um, you know, different creatures and monsters. And way up in the hilltop, uh, <clears throat> out in the woods, there used to be this old barn I could see from their back porch. And I would just sit there and think about what could possibly be up there, you know, just, you know, other than farm animals, you know, because I wanted it to be something fun. And I was really into goosebumps at the time. And I remember uh, and I was, I'm still obsessed with the monster squad. And so I always had, I like the idea of kids venturing out and finding, you know, monsters. So I started thinking, oh, man, I wonder if there's a pumpkin patch up there. And if there's a pumpkin patch, there's got to be a pumpkin man. 
And if there's a cornfield, then there's got to be a scarecrow that watches over it. And then I would start thinking about who would watch the barn. I'm like, there's got to be, there's got to be some man, you know, that or some some man figure. Or maybe it's a miner, and the miner's up in the barn, and he watches over it. And uh, my grandma, um, she's like 93 now, but she was one of those people. She was the kind of the grandmother that if you know you you messed around too much, she would tell you to go outside and break break the branch and bring it in so she could beat your ass. And uh, so she was real good at uh, disciplining. And um, we, she lived on this, uh, it's called the national road route 40 uh, through Pennsylvania. And uh, we always had hitchhikers. So it was it was never, you know, you see two or three hitchhikers a day walk past the house. And um, it was just always perfect timing on her, on her part where my cousin and I would be messing around and, you know, we're not settling down when she's wanting us to, and we're arguing. And, I just remember this one time she said, do you see that man? And she pointed to this man walking outside and he had really long hair. He was really grungy and he was carrying this big sack on his back and he had his head kind of down and he was just walking down and he looked, it was pretty terrifying looking actually. Um, and we were like, yeah. And she said, that's the boogeyman. And, he, and she said, and that sack on his back, it's filled with body parts. And if you don't settle down, he's going to cut your ears off and stick them in there. And uh, that shit, yeah, that shit stayed with me for like forever. Um, Cause it's your grandma, you know, you're supposed to not, you know, you're supposed to believe whatever they say. So that's where the idea of the boogeyman, you know, that's uh, of who was in the barn came. And that's why the boogeyman collects the flesh of the living and all that. And uh, because of my grandma, man. And uh, so that's basically how the story came about. And I was eight when I wrote it. And um, so, for years, I just, I wanted to turn it into a feature and I tried to do it in high school and it just, we started shooting it and it just looked so bad. And I just said, it's not, let's not even waste our time. We can't accomplish this. And then I went through college and um, I just really never got a chance to do something like that. I did, I did a feature documentary and a feature drama. And by the time those were done, I was done with college and out of college, I got married and bought a house and remodeled the house and started thinking I'd never get a chance to make a movie again. And, uh, one day I just, my wife got really sick and she had to have a surgery and I was just kind of thinking about what I'm going to do for the future of things, you know, to provide for her and, you know, all the things I said when we got married. And I just said, I know this is going to sound really stupid, but I'm going to make this movie and it's going to make us a bunch of money. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be the filmmaker I wanted to be and su support you like the husband I said I would. And so she agreed with me and we did it. And, um, you know, it took about two years from the time we started to get it done, and it was a success, way more than we ever expected, and, you know, it, which eventually led to me doing this full time. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy to, to look back and think of an idea I had when I was a kid is something that's so uh, important, you know, in pretty much my everyday life now, you know, as I'm, for, I'm known as the barn guy. And, uh, and it's cool to get back on set and you know, tell the next chapter of this story and bring back all these amazing people I got to work with years ago, almost six years ago, we shot the film, um, you know, and pick up where we left off. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and to talk to, and to quickly touch on uh, the barn real quick, Justin is, uh, yeah. so when you made the barn, did the, was mm -hmm. the barn actually your debut release for screen team? No, Scream Team didn't exist at the time. It was just our, uh, it was my third film for my production company, Nevermore Production Films. And it was the first horror film I, I had made, um, feature length. Uh, no, so that's the only thing I ever signed away was I signed with Terror Films uh, for the digital. And I did that just probably six months before I started Scream Team. And uh, I, I, that's kind of one of the things. Digital uh, Terror has been a, a great company, so I have no regrets with that. I just, I kind of regret. Just, I wish that the Scream Team thing would have happened six months earlier, and I would have still had my rights to that. But I have the rights to all the physical, which I still continue to sell. Um, but nope, that that wasn't a part of Scream Team. Um, it would, it would officially be the first release of Scream Team. You know, if you're if you're looking at the content that came out once I started it. But yeah, no, it was it was just just the third film from Nevermore. Okay, I should have realized it was Nevermore, but uh, I just figured out at too because because I know the barn had a lot of merch on your screen team, so that's why I figured 
it might have been the, your debut to screen team but yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense too but hey <laughs> I, you know we all gotta learn from our mistakes anyway <laughs> yeah it has the most merch because you know it was mine it's just like i said like i told you before when i talked to the filmmakers nobody's gonna put as much effort into selling your product than you will and i mean if you go and check out the site you'll see the effort i put into marketing the barn and i wish i could do that for everybody's you know film but it's expensive and not everybody has a film that you can market with board games and action figures and video games and you know just all that craziness i did uh and you know, I I start I tried to do it with the sleeper, and there was a little bit of success, but not not nearly as much as um I had with the barn. So I just kind of made it. You know, if if the filmmaker wants to go and do all that stuff, then they can do it. You know, on their own. I'm not going to have rights to do that stuff. Uh, I'll leave it to them. All right, now, now, since you mentioned the sleeper, are you talking with the uh, the hammer prop? Yeah. So I did a I did an enamel pin series. Or, you know, a line of the enamel pins. Um, we did 12 inch action figures, the, the signed hammer prop uh, with the girls, um, you know, the, the photos of the girls with the V's with lipstick across it. And then I did a, a soundtrack. Um, we did a short run of sound, like just, um, they weren't super high quality discs, but of uh, CDs. I think you did you, I think you got one, didn't you? Uh, of the sleeper soundtrack? Yes, I, I got the, uh, the two disc one. Yep, the expanded one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so yep. that was the last time we uh, I I did that because some of the items sold, some of them didn't sell so well, and uh, you know I just was like I can't do this for every release because uh, it's expensive. So I wish I could, but and to touch on about the soundtrack too, but yes, I did get the two disc uh, uh, original soundtrack there, and then. I I also found a another site for vinyls that actually had your barn one on a clearance sale, so I ended up getting it through them. So I was just oh, like, wow. oh, "Okay, cool." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I think it would be. Uh, what, I'm trying to remember your colors now. Uh, I think it would maybe the orange vinyl. Oh, the orange, yeah. Yeah, those are, I know those are all gone unless you can find them through some third-party sellers. Yeah, because I I sold all mine. <laughs> yeah, I ended up finding like uh, a clearance one for the barn vinyl, and I just said, "Well, I already got the two discs. Might as well get the vinyl too." So, <laughs> so I did. But yeah, no. Um, I I was I had to laugh when I was looking through your Scream Team releasing site one time, and I saw the Barn video game for PC. I was just like, "No way! Come on now, really?" Yeah. So that's so so it's uh so what can you describe that to me? Because I was I'm actually curious. Like, what is the Barn game there for PC? So, so I found this company and um. Philadelphia that helped me make it and it's essentially a side scroller button smasher type game uh, that's very much like Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and um, you start out with one character and uh, you have to go to the town and find all your missing friends because uh, in the very beginning of the game the kids their van breaks down they walk up to a barn to knock on it for help the lights flash and everybody disappears but Sam so then Sam's job is to go through and find, you know, the friends. And each time you find a friend, you unlock them so you can play them through the game, but they also have different abilities. Like um, Sam's really good with his knife, but if you unlock Josh and you save Josh, Josh has a battle axe, and he can do a lot of damage with his special feature uh, more than any of the other characters. Uh, but he might lack a little bit of life, and he might have less life. And then if you find Nikki, Nikki's got a shotgun, so her, hers is awesome, but she's got two hearts, so you can only take two hits before you die. So there's plus and minuses for each character. And I think, I think there's about six different levels. You go through the town, uh, you go through the, the barn, uh, the, the school hoot nanny, you go through a cemetery and a cornfield, uh, you go through the pumpkin patch, and I, I think you go through the woods, and then you play in, in the barn, in the basement of the barn. Um, 
and you get to battle all the main monsters plus all the side monsters that were in the film and then a bunch of other monsters that aren't in the film, just like when you play Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, there's bats and just all these things that they're just, you know, they're just extra enemies to, to attack. Um, but they did a really good job. I had a really hard time finding people who could make sprites that look like 8-bit, uh, you know, characters and they look like they're from the time period. So I was really happy with how they did it. And then Rocky, uh, Rocky Gray actually scored the game as well. He took the original soundtrack score and he put it through a program and turned it into an 8-bit uh, score as well. So, yeah, it was just it was a cool piece of marketing material that we did, and they got, they got a lot of uh, attention. And then we did the original run, the Indiegogo edition of The Barn, we actually sold the DVDs as a two-disc. The first disc was the movie. The second disc was a PC disc uh, to play the video game. And we we even made, like, custom um, – they were digital, but they were custom uh, digital booklets, like PDFs that look like old Nintendo booklets. And you go through and you can read about each character and, you know, their, their background, their story, their, you know, all that stuff. And you get to look at the spread of characters and the spread of enemies and all that stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was – I would never do it again just because of how hard it was to and expensive. I believe uh, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's cool it exists. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And uh, I don't think I have that one. I think I, I think the barn copy that I have is the Blu ray and D V D, I think, with the signatures and stuff. So I got your signature, I believe, on that, but yeah, and everybody else did who uh, who was available for signing, I guess. Um, I'm trying to remember, though. I'm pretty sure that just the Blu-ray and DVD with that alternate uh, cover there. So, okay. yeah. yeah, I think that's the way I'm going to just leave it because my brain will fry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's right here. Yeah, thank you to Tessa. Oh, nope, it's just the... Just the one blue right there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so there go the, there's the answer for that one. So no, nope, I did not get a two dish one. Oh well. <laughs> uh, I don't even have one. I sold them all. I didn't even keep one for myself. So yeah, see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So speaking of the barn, Justin, was there anything in the original script that you had to take out? Um, not so much in the original. I mean, from the original story, I added a lot um, just because the original story was more like a goosebumps tale. And uh, in the original story, they were more like 12 and 13 year olds. And, you know, I knew as I got older, I wanted it to feel like an, a lost 80s film. So I knew they had to be older. They had to be, you know, at least uh, on their way out of high school. So some of the things that happen with the characters, you know, is acceptable. And, um, but there were, really wasn't anything from once the updated script happened that we cut. Um, there might have just been some certain special effects that we, we couldn't pull off with what we had, and we changed some things. But, I mean, it's been like six years. I, I can barely remember. Uh, I mean, we had a ton of problems, but I can't remember anything really changing other than maybe some locations or something like that. But uh, it was more it was more adding to that story, you know, to the updated version uh, that you saw in you know in the in the final cut uh, than what it was with the original story. The original story is kind of just a mess because I was eight years old and it just kind of goes all over the place. It's it, it's it's in first person then it's in third person and it's just <laughs> it was tough. To, I kept going back to it. I mean, I really did. I went back to the original story and I'd look at it and I when I'd get kind of frustrated writing the script, I'd go, wait a second, I'll just go back to the original story and see what happens. And I'd go, oh yeah, they go to a barn dance, you know, and let's just stick with that and we'll keep it that way. So, yeah, I wish I could give you. I wish I could give you another answer, but that's that's all I got. No, that's fine. That's fine. That that works. Interesting, but huh? From first person to third person, that's a very interesting uh, idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I understood it when I was writing it. That you know, you go from like an outsider point of view to all of a sudden now he's talking about I. I picked up the you know I picked up the gun and I did this and you go back to Sam. <laughs> Sam's doing, you know, so like when you read it, it's just kind of a mind fuck. You're just like, what is going on? But, you know, there's, it's the heart behind it, I guess. No, for that, that definitely what counts anyway, always with the heart. But you saying like first person, third person, I don't know why, but it kind of 
kind of almost seems like it's a throwback to like Friday the Thirteenth, like the the original with with yeah, yeah, yeah. um where you don't know who the killer is to that third person view of maybe seeing like a like a set uh like the killer uh ah uh, god that word <laughs> you know the person like shadow since I can't pronounce so that what? thank you so oh, what? Yeah. Yeah, that that's what it kind of almost reminds me of anyway with the whole first person and third person so uh, pretty cool though and like i said that that's ridiculously young for a kid to start writing scripts but uh you probably didn't really know how to do it in the, the right format until you grew older i'm assuming but you probably um i don't know tried to do it by scene maybe when you were eight years old it's pretty much a storybook uh very very much in the vein of how a goosebumps book would be laid out yeah it wasn't uh it was definitely not in script format at all because i mean as a kid i was just excited to tell the to write a story and you know draw the monsters and stuff it wasn't until years later that i thought man i should make this into a movie I was probably 13 or 14 when I started thinking about that. Basically, about the time I, my mother got me my own video camera and I could start doing things. I remember when uh, a friend of mine and him, we used to do little short, weird story scripts. And like there was one that I uh, did where uh, I would like want to eat something, like a banana or whatever, and... My friend made or had like a prosthetic uh, pan. So when it came down to the scene, I was supposed to like take the banana peel or whatever. And I was supposed uh -huh. to put it in the, uh, the trash compactor. And when I did, we, we tried to make it the scene look like the whole uh, like trash compactor uh, somehow randomly shut on my hand to kind of take uh -huh. my hand off. So then I was like screaming bloody murder and then I like fell down on the kitchen floor. But the funny thing about this is as I'm screaming, my friend dog comes in and looks at me screaming. And then as I fall to the ground, you just see his dog make an eye, con eye contact with me all the way down to the floor. Like, dude, you're nuts. Like, like, get, like what are you doing? So... That whole scene kind of was just one weird thing, but we ended up using like ketchup for blood for uh, where my hand wasn't there anymore. And yeah, it was just really stupid. So yeah, <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> Speaking of the barn uh, part two, which you were mentioning too. So to go back on that, we did see that the barn part two was funded via Indiegogo. Yep. And we're expected a release date sometime next year. And um, for that, for the barn part two, is there any details you can share with us of what we can expect and when we could possibly be seeing the barn part two? So we are aiming to shoot the film uh, beginning in late August. Um, I'm actually in the middle of putting a building up on my property uh, to build a soundstage, makeshift soundstage, I should say. It's not going to be anything that's going to wow anybody. But it will uh, definitely be a more controlled setting to shoot in so I can build more sets. Um, so that's what we're going to be shooting then. And it's a lot of, uh, it, you know, it's not going to be shot in one stretch. It'll probably be shot over the course of four or five months. I've got a lot of people to work with. Um, the lead female in it is Lexi Drifts, who played Michelle, uh, who survived the movie at the end. She's coming back, and the story kind of follows her to begin with, and um, it's th it takes place three years later, so it'll be set in the early 90s at this point. <clears throat> and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a continuation of the first film. I mean, yeah, we're going we're gonna to miss some time in between of what happened, you know, from the events of the first movie to now, but it's going to fill in those gaps, and uh, you're going to see what has happened uh, with Michelle and, uh, you know, if or when... Sam and Josh uh, survive and make it back. You're going to see um, the same monsters, 
but a different version of them because at this point they've been defeated, so they're, they're going to bear the battle scars. So we're working on the special effects for that right now and getting the new monsters created, the, the new look, I should say. Um, you're going to see a lot more monsters in this one uh, just because we gotta we got to up it, a lot more gore. Uh, and then, a, you know, a few more cameos um, than the first one. And the nice thing about this was uh, there was a lot of people that, you know, because they don't know the behind the scenes, and I know they're just people watching, but they they'd say like, "Oh, you know, you got Linnea Quigley to be a you know be a cameo, and Ari Liebman to be a cameo." Well, from day one when we started filming the first movie and the script was done, I said I want to put things in the first movie that, in the event we're fortunate enough and there's a demand for a sequel, that there's a true continuation for why these characters and things are here. So, you're going to see the continuation story of Miss Barnhart you know, played by Linnea Quigley, and her threats uh, on banning Halloween in this town, you know, the repercussions, especially since these kids disappeared going to a rock concert on Halloween night. So that gives her some fuel to do what she wants. You're also going to see how Dr. Rock uh, is involved in some of this because of, um, you know, these kids disappearing, going to this rock concert that he promoted on his show, The Rock Block. So you're going to see how the worlds of the Rock Block and, you know, the the world of Helen Valley with Mrs. Barnhart will clash because of, of the kids disappearing, which and you're also going to see how uh, Lexi's character, Michelle, gets tied back up into these events. So without, you know, that's, that's me kind of just skirting the line because I don't want to ruin the movie for anybody. I want it to still be, you know, fun surprise when you watch it. But there's a lot of cool things and a, a lot more uh, cameos that we're working on with some, you know, 80 stars to be involved in the film. Well, that already sounds great, and I can't yeah. wait to watch it myself. So it sounds like it's going to be another fun film from you. So looking forward to it. And I was one of your backers, too. So Yes, to thank you for that. Yes. Um, so it's good to see that it's all going to somebody who will not screw anybody over, really, as we were talking no. about before. That's right. So, and, you, uh, and for anybody listening that is a backer, thank you. And uh, I'll be posting an update here soon uh, with some content that we just shot last week that has to deal with special effects. So you'll be seeing a video of that coming up very, very soon with some updates of shooting schedules for anybody who, you know, back the uh, get killed on screen by Lanier and Ari or, you know, any of the other things that involves you to be here uh, while we film. So just putting that out there too. So the next thing about, um, the barn two, uh, Justin, real quick before I give you the last question is, uh, can people still support funding that all for barn two? And if so, where and how? So, um, I'm not really sure the exact link, but if you go to Indiegogo, uh, the website for Indiegogo and you search the barn part two, uh, it should come up. I, I think it's IGG dot, com slash at like at slash the barn two but it, it, you probably have a, a much easier time just going to indiegogo and searching it but yes it's still open we're in demand because we were successful and we're going to leave it open for quite a while just because um you'd be surprised but we still probably bring in about a thousand dollars uh you know every every couple weeks if not maybe once a month of people uh, you know, still supporting it. And um, that helps us out because it gives us more money to work with just because it's expensive, especially when you're bringing people in and you got to pay for hotels and flights and food and, you know, just all that stuff. So, uh, but yeah, so I'm, people have been asking me how long I'm going to keep it up. You know, we may keep it up six more months and stop it before we start shooting, or it, it could just be up the entire time. I guess it just really all depends on how many more people um, come out of the woodwork to support it and want to grab one of these copies because this is only going to be limited to a thousand. We're going to do a pressing of a thousand of this, uh, the three disc set. So it'll be the Blu-ray, the DVD, and the soundtrack CD. And then after that, those are gone. It'll be just like how we did Indiegogo uh, with the original DVD. That was just the DVD, and then the second disc was the PC game. And once those sold out, that was it. It was out of print. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's anybody out there that wants to get killed on screen, there's still time. You know, if we're shooting in August, you still have time to to get one, I think maybe there's three or four left uh, kills um, to still be involved in that. And I think that's about it as far as being involved in the film because we sold out of the yearbook pictures pretty quick. That doesn't surprise me at all, especially when people love the uh, 
the idea of the barn. So they probably want to help out as much as they can and stuff. And to touch on Winks, uh, Justin, I'm going to actually, I actually have your barn to Indiegogo up on our website. It is under, yeah. it is under our tab for support. And this is for people listening to you and Justin, of course. But um, for people listening that do want to support, if uh, you have some weird ass time trouble, uh, weird ass type of problem finding in mm-hmm. Barn Two on Indiegogo, uh, just go to our website at eh podcast. That's e h p o d c a s t s dot com, and then what you'd want to do is hover over support. And then you're going to see a category that says crowdfunding and you'll just want to hover over that. And then a nice little side menu is going to pop up and you shall see all the crowdfunding that we either have supported like Justin's project here. And all you just got to do is click on that link and it's going to bring you right to the barn to Indiegogo. So I made sure that we are helping indie filmmaker just as Justin himself to help promote any more extra funds as possible. So you can always go there as well. Yeah, I, I actually, I think I saw that post. Uh, maybe it was on Instagram that you made that. So I appreciate, uh, it was either Instagram or Facebook with a link. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it would both. I, I wanted to make sure I got the word out everywhere that I could because you know how Twitter is. They're very strict on how many words you can have and uh, so stupid. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So, real quick, Justin, is there anything else, too, that I did not mention at all that you would like to mention real quick? Basically, if, uh, you know, if, if anybody wants to uh, check out some of the other projects that I'm involved in, um, I, we've got Force to Fear, that's Dane Hirschberger's film. Uh, I believe you can find that on Facebook.com forward slash Force to Fear. Uh, and there's also the cryptids film I was talking about earlier uh, with Billy Pond that is involved, and I believe that's Facebook.com forward slash cryptids. Mo- maybe it's cryptids movie. Um, let me see here before I give out the wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, it's not there. Maybe it's just cryptids. No, I'm not good at this. But uh, we actually just got the poster back. We had Say to Start Designs do it, and uh, it's awesome. So. We're waiting for, uh, we have somebody else cast in one of the segments um, before we reveal the poster and the cast announcement, but it should be coming here very soon. And if we get who we're hoping, it's going to be, it's going to make the movie that much better. Mm. And if, if you're not familiar what cryptids are, that's uh, basically unknown creatures, um, Bigfoot, Loch Ness, Mothman, things like that. So we cover a lot of those in this film. Um, different cryptic encounters, uh, like the Chupacabra, uh, the Bigfoot, um, the Loveland Frogman, the Dover Demon, uh, the Jersey Devil, um, and then some ones people have never probably heard of that much. Uh, like the story I did was called The Beast of Bladenboro, and um, uh, Zane did, I think it was, I think they're from Ohio, they're called the, the Melonheads, and oh boy, there's so many monsters. But, um, but yeah, so we got some A-listers, and we got some, you know, I guess you'd call them B's and C-listers that people aren't familiar with. The Mothman, obviously, got to happen in there. So, uh, so yeah, it's cool. I think it's, if, if you're into old-school creature features, you know, this is definitely up that alley, you know, for anybody who enjoys those, because it's all practical effects where, where it can be done. Sometimes you have to do some visual stuff, but uh, for the most part, it's about 95% uh, practical. It's going to be a cool project. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for people to check it out when it's done. Man, that I'm already excited for this already. So, <laughs> yeah, this sounds great. And once again, you'll probably see my name show up there someday. <laughs> so, and uh, so, Justin, the re- the, uh, bleh, the last question I got for you is: Now, I know we kind of talked about it earlier, but this is to also touch on it because as we were talking about. Um, Amazon targeting indies, and you were mentioning about the digital stuff. Yeah. So now, for this question is, have you, because of the whole Amazon and maybe 
what could happen is other companies start targeting indie films for whatever reason because you know maybe it has something to do with hollywood wanting to target them i mean nobody really knows because nobody really gets an email that really specifically says why their film got pulled but just out of mm -hmm. curiosity have you ever thought of starting possibly like a screen team streaming service to also you know, help yeah. Indie films? Yeah, you know, I've got, I've been asked that uh, by a lot of people and because I'm, you know, I've been so focused on the physical side of things, I don't really know too much about the digital side and I'm actually working on that now with talking to people and, and learning more about, uh, you know, just how it works, the platforms and how even feasible it is to, uh, to get in, in there because, you know, Amazon, um, Amazon and iTunes, you know, there's costs associated with it. Sometimes it's, it's next to nothing. Other times it's a lot, but some of the other places are really expensive. And, um, you know, that, that's why like when I, when I first signed with Terror, it was nice because they were going to take on all the costs up front, just like I do with manufacturing. Um, and I need to find, uh, I need to look into it and see if I think it's even going to be worth it uh, on my end to do those kind of things. I mean, it'd be, it would be great to be able to tell, to be a one-stop shop if if um, somebody wants to sign with me and they want to do digital and physical and I can help them out. But uh, I, I really don't know how it works as far as cre creating a streaming site. Um, you know what I mean? Kind of like an indie Netflix or something like that. That's that's what people ask me all the time. And I, 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 wish, I wish I had the answers to it, but I don't. Uh, definitely going to look into it, though. Justin, thank you for your time. And I hope that uh, we can hear more from you. And speaking of which, please feel free to plug any type of social media outlet where we can keep up with everything and anything Screen Team or even you to help know what comes out in the Screen Team release in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, so you can, I mean, the number one place to find out stuff about Screen Team is ScreenTeamReleasing.com. Uh, you can find me also on Facebook at Screen Team Releasing and on Instagram at Screen Team Releasing. Uh, and that's pretty much the most places, you know, that I, I really keep active. Uh, you also check out the um, Facebook.com forward slash The Barn Movie. That will take you there and you'll keep up to date on any uh, updates that I put out for The Barn been pretty quiet lately just because i you know we've been working diligently uh over the course of the holidays getting things prepared and you know worked out but for not only the barn part two but for you know upcoming features and uh, i'm excited because i've got a lot of cool content coming out this year um and even more so uh some some things that probably you know they're they're great films they might not be as hardcore horror as some of the other other titles I put out, but they're great films, and I'm excited to see uh, how the audience embraces these upcoming titles. But I, I wish I could give names, but we, you know we've got more. We just put out uh, "She Was So Pretty" and "She Was So Pretty Too," uh, a double um, release, a double feature on one Blu-ray. We've got more of those coming out. Um, the next one will be a double feature as well, two separate films, but uh, very much in the same vein of each other. They, they partner really well. So we hope to do that uh, a couple times a year, have the double features coming out for filmmakers, um, uh, you know, just to basically help each other with the exposure of each film being on the same disc. So, yeah, keep up to date with that. And uh, anytime you buy from our store, you know, uh, upon checkout, you get a chance to be involved in the um, the newsletter, which we try to email out the people as soon as the pre-order comes in or anything like that. And that's your best chance of getting a hold of some of the the content that sometimes sells out very quickly and other times it stays there for a few months. So uh, I highly recommend, you know, popping into that and um, having a chance to get those, those updates. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Just for the record, I think I'm missing like two films from your screen team. I think unless that other one that you announced came out yet. So I don't remember the name at the very moment, but you did announce one and I believe it was, sometime last month or something, or it was supposed to be coming out last month? Um, she was so pretty came out last month, and uh, we're doing a pre-order here in a couple weeks for close calls. Yeah, that's the last one, close calls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. so I'm missing two, almost three now. So oh, not no. that's, that's not too bad, no. And for anybody who's looking into close calls, I will tell you this, that it is a two-hour-long movie, and the making of documentary that is also on this uh, 
in this collection is a two and a half hour making of. So it's longer wow. than the movie. <laughs> it's very anybody who wants to see uh, uh, the struggle, how the struggle of filmmaking takes its toll, and people can still, uh, you know, conquer a film at the end of the day. You need to watch this. It's it's pretty incredible. They had a hard time, and it's one of the reasons why Richard uh, Stringham, who's the director of that film, why he signed with me, because uh, he knew. Uh, once he watched The Barn uh, and he watched my making of, he realized we were in the same boat and very much uh, went through the same process of having a struggle of making a movie. So I'd say, you know, if you've seen Close Calls and you liked it, you definitely don't want to miss out on this making of documentary. Well, I will try my best to help out that movie as well, but we'll see where my funds are because right now I'm... <laughs> I'm in the slow season at my job, so Bill's kind of coming. I was looking at yeah. But once again, Justin, thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. And looking forward to having you reappear on our show again at some point. And I just want to throw it out there. Even if you don't want to talk just Scream Team and you just want to talk horror with us, you're welcome on any upcoming episode that we are working on. And, oh, great. For, those, and for those listening, too, we're actually going to be doing an episode where one of our guests that we did interview is actually going to be hosting the round table coming out this month on the, we're going to, well, we're going to be recording it on the 16th of this month around 9 PM. So, uh, so Justin, if you are interested and free to talk about practical effects and why we should get younger people to start at an early age you're more than welcome to join us that night as well okay great so thank you so much again i know i probably said that three or four times already and anyway as always guys thank you so much for listening and applaud for justin and for those indie filmmakers that may be listening to this justin is your guy okay you just trust him with your media and he will get it done for you and Thank he does you. a fantastic job because otherwise I wouldn't be talking with Justin right now if I didn't believe in his work. So there's that. And that's a good compliment. And as yeah. always, stay scary, everybody.